Hello there. Welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines where you are. Let down by those who should have cared for them, our exclusive report uncovers the shocking treatment of eight disabled adults at a care home in Sittingbourne. They took away his dignity, his confidence, his human rights, and they wrecked everything. Tonight we ask, why is the same care provider still looking after vulnerable people in Kent? Also this Monday evening, the new sport gaining popularity in the South East. All you need to know about playing pickleball. And spring is springing up earlier than ever. We're in the high wheel to find out if there's a price to pay for all this magical March colour. Good evening. Eight people with severe learning difficulties were over-medicated and unlawfully restrained at a care home in Kent. In a damning report seen exclusively by ITV News Meridian, inspectors found the conditions at Berkeley House in Sittingbourne to be unsafe. It also said that the basic human rights of some of the most vulnerable people in society weren't considered. Two of the families of the people living there said the provider called Achieve Together should never be allowed to operate a care home again, but it does. Well, the report was compiled by the independent regulator, the Care Quality Commission. And Joe Koshin, our reporter, has been following the story. He's live in Sittingbourne for us now. Joe, Berkeley House no longer operating, but the families there have been left distraught by the report's findings. Yes, they certainly have, Sangeeta, hurt and angered by what they now know happened behind these gates. Now, Berkeley House hasn't changed much since I was last here back in December when families told me about how their relatives who have learning difficulties and require around-the-clock care were given just five hours' notice. Five hours before they were evicted from their homes. Some of them had lived here for more than a decade. Now, they were devastated but they didn't quite know what happened here at Berkeley House. As soon as the padlock went on and it was locked up for good, they thought they'd never find the answers. But they know now with this damning CQC report, which makes for difficult reading. Hiya. Yes, darling. Michael Wakefield is trying to settle into his new house. Four months after being suddenly evicted from Berkeley House, a place he called home for 10 years. Since the move, he has been diagnosed with PTSD, a diagnosis his parents can now truly understand, given what was uncovered by inspectors. They took away his dignity, his confidence, his human rights. Yeah, absolutely his human rights. And they wrecked everything. And we have to start again, we have to start again, helping to rebuild his life from scratch almost. The Care Quality Commission report says some of the residents had been unlawfully restrained and harmed by staff. Their human rights were not upheld and the leadership was inadequate. You try and read it dispassionately but you can't help thinking, my son was in the middle of all that. And it almost reads like something you would read from um, you know, care homes in sort of developing countries. And the times we sat here writing emails or on the phone to management trying to get them to improve the resources in Michael's house because we could see that he was suffering as a result of there not being enough staff. And Michael had a good life yeah. there. He was happy. He had, about, like his life's not... Well, at the moment, his life is in pieces. Scrap paper was stapled to people's records. One which read, appeared very unsettled through the night. He has been banging his head against the wall clapping and making series of noise. Inspectors found no further action was taken and there wasn't a referral to a healthcare professional. The watchdog also found there was insufficient staff to meet people's complex needs and they lacked the skills to support residents in times of distress. What was particularly alarming for inspectors was that medication was not managed safely. One resident was prescribed medicines as required, but he was only supposed to be given pills when he became aggressive. Instead, he was given sedatives twice every day, whether he needed them or not. And these are residents with no voice that can't actually express themselves, that can't tell people how things, the, what's actually going on. Paul believes the person the report refers to is his son Lawrence. We're speaking to Paul virtually because of the impact this has had on his health. 
it's just horrible because that takes his personality away and he's got a lovely personality and it's he's going to be drugged the whole time and I was really shocked to find that out and I only found that out through social services not through Achieve Together and I found it out just about the time the the report came out and when the closure happened um, he did seem to settle down quite quickly into his new location and that could have possibly been just the fact that the drugs were still in his system. So we absolutely take on board the views of the families and this terrible situation that them and their loved ones have been put in um, and we want to make sure that no care service provides um, stand the care that falls below the standards that we would expect and although we currently have no regulatory remit over Berkeley House because it's closed we are working really closely with Achieve Together's leadership team to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Shockingly, what happened at Berkeley House had happened elsewhere. It wasn't the first time. There were issues of the people getting the wrong medication, too much medication, not enough medication. Ed Church made public more damning inspections of homes run by Achieve Together, this time in Cornwall last year. It prompted the company to pull out of the area altogether after Cornwall Council threatened to revoke its right to care. And, and the problem was not particularly with individual staff being bad at their jobs. It was that there weren't enough of them. And the ones that were there were inadequately trained, uh, seemingly from what the report says, uh, because of mismanagement. Achieve Together declined our request for an interview, but sent us this statement. For over 25 years, they have been committed to delivering specialist care and support. And this is reflected in 92% of their services being rated good or outstanding, significantly above the national average. However, they sincerely regret that localised recruitment challenges at a very small number of their services have contributed to services being below the high standards that people rightly expect. And they wholeheartedly apologise for this. Since the CQC inspection of Berkeley House in October, they have taken all feedback extremely seriously and they are clear that lessons have been learnt. So an apology, yes, but little comfort for the residents and their families who, despite the vital care they needed, were badly let down. Well, Achieve Together admitted problems at Berkeley House, but the spotlight remains on them. The Care Quality Commission also highlighted several breaches of the Health and Social Care Act in relation to this report. Failures relating to dignity and respect, the need for consent, safe care and treatment, good governance, staffing and duty of candour. But now that Berkeley House has been deregistered, all six of those breaches effectively disappear. No further action is taken against Achieve Together and they no longer matter, except they do to the relatives of people who used to live here. They say how many more homes need to end up like this before someone is held accountable. Now the CQC admits there is nothing it can do in terms of those breaches but it says and it has stressed that it's monitoring the 230 plus homes run by Achieve Together on behalf of local councils to ensure that residents are protected, that they are looked after and that this never happens again. Jo, live in Sittingbourne tonight, thank you. Five children have been arrested after a 13-year-old boy was stabbed in Worthing yesterday. One of those detained is just 12 years old. The attack happened in Chapel Road at just before 5pm. The victim remains in hospital, but his injuries are thankfully not considered to be life-threatening. Police have warned youth violence will not be tolerated. Bin men in Ada and Worthing have begun a strike. The walkout follows earlier disputes in Brighton and Eastbourne. The GMB union says two weeks of action should be expected in the dispute over pay. The council says it has plans aiming to minimise the strike's impact. One of Kent's oldest butchers has gone into administration. J.C. Rook & Sons opened its first store in Dover in 1965 and went on to open 10 more across the county. But it's now thought more than 130 jobs are at risk, with the firm speaking of its heartbreak of closing the shops on social media. 
44 electric car charging points are to be installed across Ashford and Tenterden. Ashford Borough Council has been awarded a grant of up to £174,000 to carry out the work at its car parks. The father and son have travelled more than a thousand miles from their home in Sussex to help refugees escaping the war in Ukraine. Richard and Finn Paisley from Hurst Pierpoint have delivered vital supplies to a reception area on the border with Poland. They describe the situation there as heartbreaking. Malcolm Shaw has been speaking to them. Refugees arrive in Poland having fled their homes in Ukraine. Desperate scenes witnessed by Richard Paisley from Sussex. We're at the border for the first time. It's quite depressing, I've got to say. Probably the best way to describe it is just the kind of you see behind us. There's just a lot of people queuing up, a lot of kids, um, all of uh, jelly babies and stuff, everybody. And um, I think we're going to head back into town and sort of start doing some drops. There's nothing really here. Richard and his son, Finn, were so moved by the plight of the Ukrainians, they drove a van full of supplies from their home in Herspier Point, more than a thousand miles, to a crossing point on the Polish border. We put a shout out to a few people and, and just thought, look, if we can take a, if we can take a van full and just drive it there, and, and that, that, will, that will make some difference. But actually, you know, as with a lot of these things, it takes on a life of its own. And a lot of people, so many people just wanted to help. So people came around, we had people dropping all sorts of supplies to us, bandages and needles, all sorts of great stuff. The Paisleys also set up crowdfunding and have raised more than £16,000 to restock supplies on the ground in Poland. It's been pretty horrific, as you can imagine. I mean, everyone's seen it on the news, what it's like. Um, and just seeing things like that in uh up close and personal is, uh, yeah, it's quite harrowing, really. People are shell-shocked, really. They're coming over and their, um, their whole lives have been um, destroyed. And in the midst of it all, a poignant moment as an Italian aid worker plays a battered piano. This guy just starts playing Imagine on the piano in the middle of all of this and, and the, the kind of juxtaposition of him playing Imagine with this kind of stream of misery coming through it was just incredible. And, and I think everybody there just stopped dead. I mean, it's an amazing thing to have done. A show of humanity in a humanitarian crisis. Malcolm Shaw, ITV News. Now you're watching ITV News in the Meridian region still to come on our programme this evening. Kent Cinema's latest success story and last night's BAFTA triumphs. And of course, you can find more on all of today's stories on our website, itv.com slash meridian is the address. Uh, you can call us and you can follow us online. A mother of two from Southend has been reunited with her sons after undergoing a life-saving heart transplant. In total, she spent 190 days in hospital and lost 80% of her blood during an operation. Well, now she's finally back home and our reporter Charlie Frost has been to meet her. After a six-month stay in critical care, this was Nicholas Sharp's long-awaited goodbye. From the clapping hands of her doctors and nurses to the arms of her two children, who were thrilled to have her home. You need a haircut, Mum. <laughs> oh, it's just so great. You just think, yes, you know, we did it, we did it. So it was just so lovely, so warm, yeah. So that was, that was just brilliant. Two years ago, a normally active Nicola noticed she was getting unusually out of breath. She was diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy, a type of heart disease, and fitted with a pacemaker. But in August last year, her condition worsened. She suffered heart failure and six months of living in intensive care and undergoing several complex operations began. I'm just very thankful for the skills of the surgeons at the time because I bled out 80% of my blood which you know you're not supposed to survive but they got me back. And she was determined to live for her two boys nine-year-old Finlay and 13-year-old Rory especially as her husband Peter died of a sudden and unexplained heart condition seven years ago. I just thought I've just got to survive for my kids they deserve to have a parent. Uh, it's just been a gift of life I mean it's not just my life that's been saved 
it's the children's as well. The young boys will have a mum for a bit longer. Mm. Charlie Frost, ITV News in South End. Wishing Nicola all the best. The ITV Evening News continues here at 6.30 with more Mary Nightingale. Closing in on Kyiv, Russia strikes at civilian buildings in the Ukrainian capital. This apartment block is just four miles from the centre, but can the latest peace talks halt Russia's advance? As thousands flee, the new refugee scheme goes live, allowing Britons to open up their homes. Also ahead, Lewis Hamilton is changing his name. We'll tell you what to and why. And... I'm repairing the place where I live, because no one can bother to do it. The rock star road mender and why he's been ticked off by his local council. Well, do join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Brilliant. A film set in Kent has won a prestigious prize in last night's BAFTA Awards. After Love was filmed in Dover and Deal, and the film star Joanna Scanlon scooped the lead actress prize. Well, as Abigail Bracken reports, she beat some pretty high-profile competitors, and her surprise showed in her speech. With a backdrop of the White Cliffs of Dover, the film After Love picked up one of the biggest prizes in last night's BAFTA Awards. It's star Joanna Scanlon scooping the lead actress prize for her stunning performance, beating better-known nominees like Lady Gaga. Her surprise was clear. Come on. <laughs> As we say in my country. Oh, BAFTA, thank you so much. After Love was written by Kent-born Aline Khan and filmed in Dover and nearby Kingsdown. It challenges stereotypes about Islam, following the story of a widow who had converted to become a Muslim for her husband, but after his death, discovers a devastating secret. The success of After Love comes at a booming time for the South East film industry. Director Sam Mendes is setting his latest movie in Margate, just this month making Dreamland look like an old cinema and a wintry one. So businesses in Margate and Dover will no doubt be hoping for a tourism boost from featuring on the big screen. Abigail Bracken, ITV News. Now, in the United States, it's a sport that has attracted more than four million players. The game is called pickleball, which may raise a smile, but it's causing some to raise their game, including celebrities, the Kardashian family and George Clooney. And as Tony Green finds out, it's catching on this side of the pond too. The best things about it, it's great fun, good exercise at any age and as competitive as you want it to be. The worst thing about it, its name, pickleball. Something these players in Cranbrook have decided to put to one side. Apparently the name comes from the Americans who invented it. Their dog was called Pickle and it kept taking the ball. So the story goes. The best way to describe it is like playing table tennis but standing on the table with a scoring a bit like squash. And what are the rules? Very, very straightforward and, and very sensible. The serve must be underarm. The return of serve has got to bounce first and then there's a no volley zone seven feet back from the net. As a child I did play tennis but since that I didn't so I started this when I was 49. Um, and I just loved it. It was really good, something I could do. I really enjoyed it. It keeps me fit. Is it competitive? It is quite competitive, yes. Yes, very. So people take this seriously? This isn't just a bit of fun? Oh, yeah, but it is a bit of fun as well. You know, as long as you have a good game, it doesn't matter the outcome. Just enjoy it. And how would you rate yourself as a player? <sighs> Middling. <laughs> Middling. <laughs> Next month, Michael Taylor will be competing in the Pickleball US Open. The US have four to five million players, and it's the fastest growing sport in the USA. Uh, in fact, the fastest growing sport in the world. The normal response is, what a stupid name for a sport, which it is. It was my reaction when I first was told about Pickleball. Um, but once people see Pickleball, and if, if you Google professional Pickleball on the web, you'll see brilliant players playing great pickleball. Perhaps if it had a more sensible name, even more people might play. Even so, pickleball's popularity is picking up pace. Tony Green, ITV News, Cranbrook.
It does look really good fun, doesn't it? I know what he means about the name, though. I quite like it. Say it with an American <laughs> accent. Hey, it's I'm true. off to play pickleball. <laughs> Sorry. It's all got a bit weird, some of you. <laughs> <laughs> I want the Pickleball World Cup. I want to go to that. Yeah, you might be in the US Open next year. You never know if you start practicing. We can only hope. <laughs> Now, officially, we still have a week or so before the start of spring, but you might have noticed plenty of flowers already popping up in your garden or park. Well, while it may look pretty, experts are warning that plants blooming earlier than usual is a sign that our climate is changing, as Nick Smith reports. <laughs> At Riverhill Himalayan Gardens near Seven Oaks, spring has already sprung in many of the flower beds. Misako Kasahara is the head gardener here and says even after an unusually dry winter, some plants are out in bloom earlier than usual. I have noticed, especially this year, spring has been very early because the winter was very mild. So we have now, at the beginning of March, I have now four sites here start to flower, which is very early. Roses we prune, they are supposed to lose leaves completely in winter, generally, which didn't happen. Well, this stunning cherry plum is now in bloom several weeks earlier than in decades gone by. And while it certainly brightens up a gloomy day in mid-March, it's the sign of a worrying trend. The flora around us is sending a warning that the seasons are shifting as the speed of climate change intensifies. Researchers at the University of Cambridge recently released a study analysing flowering data from over two centuries, and it provided some stark results. We found this systematic shift that plants, on average, are flowering up to a month earlier than they did before. If it's getting warmer, certain species are able to adapt to the warming rapidly, quickly, whereas others are slower, there is a delay, and this could result in what we call ecological mismatch. That means many pollinators may struggle to cope with a shifting time frame for when they can collect nectar from flowers, potentially jeopardizing whole food chains. So what can gardeners do to try and adapt to our seasons shifting and give wildlife a helping hand? Hellebores are really resilient. This is their time of season. But I mean, look, they're a great plant to have out. They have a single flower, which makes it a lot easier for pollinators to come and get the nectar. Arit Anderson is a garden designer who tells me those with green fingers can find ways of coping with more variable weather. We're beginning to see the effects of climate change, you know, the real big downpours of rain and the extreme heat that we've been having. If that heavy rainfall comes, comes down, you know, that's it, you've lost all your flowers. So I think people having to think about having a variety, a diverse amount of flowers in their borders. If we can get a mix of native and non-native, some of the non-natives can bridge the gap in flowering time to mitigate the heavy downpour or the extreme temperature. Newly released scientific data that flowers are blooming earlier may just be confirming a phenomena that gardeners have been observing for some time now. And if the warming of the planet continues to gather pace, we may have to brace ourselves for even more dramatic changes to our surroundings. Nick Smith, ITV News. Holly's with us now. Holly, that's quite concerning, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, of course it is. I mean, we've just had the eighth mildest winter on record. Five of the top ten winters have all been since 2010. And of course... So many of us love to see the spring flowers coming out, the rise in temperatures, but we have to bear in mind that uh, the rise in temperatures, the extremes of weather, all do obviously have a pretty devastating impact, really, on our environment. Fortunately, nothing too extreme for today. In fact, we've almost got the opposite of extreme. Take a look at this weather map, um, because we have got various lows and highs, but none of them across us. We've got a low up towards Greenland, one towards uh, Iberia there. We've got a high across the Azores, one uh, over Eastern Europe, and we're sort of in the middle. Um, that's what your winds are doing, so clockwise around the highs and clockwise around the lows. And what we have got is known as a coal. A coal. coal. A coal, which I bet you have never heard of before. But no. this is basically when you've got neither one nor the other. It's also known as a saddle point, because if you imagine a saddle, you've got the high bit ahead of you and behind you to keep you on the horse, and then the low bit either side of the horse, which stops you falling off. So it's also a saddle point. Um, and it sort of gives you some weather you'd associate with high pressure and some weather you'd associate with low pressure. Uh, so I had this lovely shot in this morning of beautiful sunshine, but that foggy start. Nice. Classic high pressure weather. But then we've also had the cloud bubbling up and showers generating, which you would normally associate with low pressure. So 
there we go that's what a coal does for you i was just thinking classic high pressure weather photo that where, where are you classic. i was thinking coal short for colin let's get the forecast yes holly <laughs> Feels like home, whatever the weather. Valent Boilers and Heat Pumps, sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Well, we've got some mist and fog in the forecast tonight, and it's not all plain sailing. There is some rain around today. Of course, we had some showers. I think later on Wednesday, we'll see some rain pushing our way as well. There's a bit of uncertainty on the timing, but otherwise, hopefully this week should feel pretty pleasant. So today, we've got our coal in place. Tomorrow is quite quiet. Uh, Wednesday, though, we've got weather fronts approaching. As I say, that's going to bring some rain later on. But then high pressure dominates for the tail end of the week, and that should bring us some sunshine. For the time being then, well, you could see a few showers still lurking, otherwise starry skies developing. Temperatures take a little bit of a tumble, mostly I think frost-free, although we could perhaps see a touch in places and some mist and fog forms. That, of course, could be a bit of a hazard on the roads. So watch out for that tomorrow morning. Otherwise, as I say, a chilly start, but actually, once the mist and fog clears, it should do by around maybe 9 o'clock, some pockets perhaps lasting a little longer. But hopefully all of us get to see some sunshine, a touch more high-level cloud filtering in as the day goes on, but still, I think, remaining bright. And temperature's not bad, that little bit higher than today and above average for the time of year, up to around 12, 13 degrees, maybe locally a 14. Our high tide times, you've got Dover at 9.32 and again at 9.50 as we head into the evening and the outlook. Well, I think Wednesday is going to be the most disappointing day, although ahead of the rain, it could actually feel quite warm into the mid-teens, uh, but that rain likely to arrive as we head through the afternoon, perhaps into the evening. We'll keep an eye on that timing. After that, then look at that, some sunshine to be had, temperatures on the up, though still perhaps some chilly nights. Take care. Valent. Sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Things looking promising by the end of the week. In just a moment, the ITV Evening News continues here with Mary Nightingale. Uh, for now, though, that is it uh, from us and the team. We are back tomorrow, of course. Until then, have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.